Welcome to Arts Talk TV, where we share the creative perspective and get the conversation started. Hi, I'm Karina Lawrence and welcome to Arts Talk TV. I'm here at the incredible Vox Studio in Corumban on the Gold Coast. Now it's a boutique style, one of a kind music studio that offers endless professional facilities and abilities. I'm here with its founder and incredible musician, as well as Australia's leading man, who has been a recognized star throughout the world. Please welcome to the show, the beautiful Andy and Simon Gallagher. Hello. Hello. Thanks Hello. so much for joining us. Fun to be here. Before we go into your incredible careers and your journeys, tell us what it's like seeing how you guys grew up. I'm assuming in a musical family, like what was it like with each other considering that you've transitioned now into having very successful careers, the two of you? Yeah, it was fun. <laughs> it was fun, but we had dedicated parents who would always encourage, but also Kids, no matter who they are, have a tendency to not want to do their practice. But my, uh, our parents were great at that. So go, go in and do it. And you know, you've committed to this, you've committed to that, so you've got to give it your best shot. So I think we're both very fortunate that we had that sort of grounding and background. Very our much. parents aren't show business people either. So uh, it was all just for personal development. Hmm. There was always a lot of crazy instruments around the house. It was moving from cello to trumpet to... A flute. Flute. To piano. Yes. Always had a piano in the house, which yes. was very fortunate to, yeah. to grow up with. Absolutely. However, when the time came when we were both said at, at different stages that we want to do it as a profession, they went, what? <laughs> <laughs> What are you going to do for a real job? Uh, yes, <laughs> yeah. yes. See that reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder up there? Yeah. Well, that belonged to our father. And um, I was a, a fiddler with this sort of stuff. So I worked out that, oh, OK, I'm nagged and nagged about doing my piano practice. So I'll record it. And then the next morning before school, when my mother said, go and do your piano practice, I went into the lounge room and I turned the tape on. And then she's, she's calling out saying, she was in, her, in the bedroom doing a makeup or something. She calls out, that's much better than yesterday. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nonetheless, though, it certainly uh, allowed you guys to blossom and facilitate into uh, the exploring of not just musicality, but performing, um, television, uh, some incredible achievements you guys have done. And my understanding, Simon, you've really contributed to allowing uh, your company. Tell us more about that production, which in turn has created more work in the yeah. industry. I was managing myself, looking after all of the day-to-day the -day things. So as, as time moved on, I thought, well, let's ex extend that. I produced some of my own records, for instance. But then it, was, it seemed like, to me like a logical step to then say, well, let's put on a full musical and see if we can get it right. We formed it with a whole troupe of people. So consequently, other shows uh, snowballed from that. And, uh, and of course, it wasn't too long before Sis here came along and uh, joined the company. Well, you guys both followed in each other's footsteps to a degree with regards to your training. You both trained at the Queensland Conservatorium of Music. Andy, you studied in piano, flute and majored in voice. Mm -hmm. And then Simon, you had a Bachelor of Music. I was majoring in singing, piano, cello and uh, guitar. I certainly can sense even more. You get to a stage where it evolves, evolves, and you want to continue to transition and open up opportunities mm. that, in a way, um, test your boundaries and allow you to blossom even further and develop. And probably being on the other side of creating the work ethic and work opportunities. And creating work for others, that's, yes. that's right. Yeah. But you know, our early careers were, were also sort of parallel because when I was at the conservatorium, I'd go and moonlight in the piano bar mm. and play and sing. What happened? Sister comes along and does the same thing in a yeah. different hotel a little bit later on. Mm. So playing and singing was something that, um, that worked for both of us. 
So did Simon influence you a lot, do you think, Andy, or was it just your... You know, I think it, it would be hard not to be influenced because uh, I was constantly so surrounded by music. Dad always on the piano, uh, Simon always on the piano, and us just as a family, Sunday dinners, singing around the piano with our grandmother, just constantly immersed in it. Together you guys with Simon's company have starred in Pirates of Penzance, which was an Australian and a New Zealand mm -hmm. tour. Also at QPAC, which yeah. was a great success. Mikado, also um, showing in Brisbane and Adelaide. HMS Pinafore. Mikado went, went to New Zealand. As well. Mikado went to New Zealand for the first production that we did. I'm assuming you were the leading lady as well. A funny thing happened on the way to the forum. Yes, well that's a very interesting story actually. Do you want to? Yes, well, we did two productions of The Merry Widow. Yeah. The first one was just for Brisbane. Yeah. And it starred Helen Donaldson as The Merry Widow. Yeah. There was a sickness that went through the company. Mm. The lady who was opposite me went off sick. So we thought, what are we going to do? We've got 2,000 people out there, 100 in the cast. The show must go on. The show must go on. So my mm. sister came, had never worked on the show uh, in, that uh, in that in role. that role. I, I had been role. sitting in the wings and watched it uh, each night. So I was just watching the role and clearly I knew the music, but. Uh, so we not... had about six hours rehearsal. Yeah, that. And, right. and then, some of the songs you didn't know, so weren't they mimed? Uh, I think one, one of was them mimed, was. And one of a them woman was. was singing it backstage and Andy was mouthing. But literally, we went home that night and they made the decision, look, you know, if the, sh if the curtain's going to go up, you will, you know, make this happen via this process. So I didn't sleep that night and one of the other guys from the show came and helped me right through the night and then the next morning went on and I went on opposite my brother as the leading and lady. she saved the show. <laughs> yeah. oh, wow. Saved the show. It's an incredible opportunity for yourself on a personal level and a performance level, but how do it you process that? It was an incredibly how... stressful yeah. process. <laughs> she was a bit like a puppet, like a glove puppet, and I had a hand behind her. Like, over, over there, there. Right, over there. there. It shows um, how important and relevant training is, though, at the end absolutely, of the day. Absolutely, absolutely. You know? Andy, you're a re highly respected singer, a musician in the industry, but you've also a songwriter, studio technician, actress, performer. Your studio is incredible. Thank you. Tell very us much. more about it. You um, you can come here for training for piano. well, lots of things: voice, uh, piano, guitar. I work a lot in the recording industry. People who are songwriters, and they come with some, you know, sketch ideas of what they would like to create into a bigger production. So they'll come to me and a bit of like a, a sketch, and I'll colour in for them and make some suggestions with musical arrangements. And because I can play a couple of different instruments and I have all of the facilities with the studio, we have a lot of fun. Originally, the studio started out mainly focusing on voice and then just kept evolving into us putting on our own shows and we've been putting on uh, two shows a year for quite a few years now. During those shows I work a lot with the younger kids who I create a platform for them to get out there and be able to actually instead of just working in a studio be able to get out there and put um, what they've been focusing on, on stage, have a live audience. I'm very strict about the whole introduction of stage etiquette and stage presentation and backstage etiquette and all of that sort of stuff. I think that that's uh, a great, you know, foundation. Simon, going back, age 15, you hosted a children's television show called Simon Scene that was shown on channel seven. seven. Yes, when there was only black and white TV. I was actually one of the um, the hosts that introduced colour television to Brisbane in March of 75, because I was working for Seven doing my kids' show then. It was a real, you know, a fantastic introduction, but also fantastic lesson in uh, how television works behind the scenes, and I'm not talking about behind the cameras, but up in the admin where all decisions are made. And I just thought it was all a bit of fun. 
But as far as they were concerned, this is about making money and it's about being number one. So it was ratings, ratings. So the pressure for a 15 year old was immense, I found very quickly. Also, I discovered that if the ratings were great, they would pat themselves on the back upstairs and go take themselves off to lunch. If the ratings were bad, it's all your fault. Interesting. <laughs> it, it was a sort of bittersweet time, but it gave me a great uh, insight to what was ahead and what I needed to forearm myself if I wanted to move forward. Good lessons, I can imagine. So how did you fall into that opportunity? <laughs> well, it was weird that I was, I was going to school and the headmaster called me up and he said, the, um, the religious program have called us and they'd like a young fella to read the religious news on Channel 7 for their monthly program that they do. I said, and they said, you're a good reader and you run our media centre, so we, how about would you do it? And I said, oh, when does it have to happen? They said, oh, we'll give you a day off school once a month and you go up to do it. Day off school. <laughs> yeah. That's what did it. Yeah. I'm in. So yeah. I went up, had never been into a television studio before. So I'm sitting in the makeup chair and the, and the lady's putting the makeup on and she's saying to me, and what are you going to do when you leave school? And I'm looking around saying, oh, I'm going to get into TV. Wow. <laughs> And th that was just because it was like impressionable on yeah, you totally, at that stage? Totally. She then said to me, they're auditioning for the kids show in Studio One at this very minute. How about I take you in? And I did. They, and she did. And I got the job. Um, some of the other shows that you've um, starred in is Hello Dolly, one of my favourites. I think that was one of my professionals. I played Ermengarde when I was 14. Did you? Yeah. Ermengarde, so, um, she's funny. I played the role of Cornelius who's got a lovely song called It Only Takes a Moment. That role was played by Michael Crawford in the film with Barbara Streisand. They were big shoes to fill, but good fun to play. Hello Dolly was revived in the 80s with an actress in Australia called Jill Perryman. And Jill had been the original funny girl in Australia. Big, big star. So I, in very recent times, was doing the musical Wicked and we were opening in Perth and I said to the two leading ladies, I said, Jill Perryman is here tonight in the audience. And they said, who? Now you see, that's terrible. It's yeah. not their fault necessarily, no. but you know, these are icons and, and they they're still- away. Yes. Yeah, they and away. they're still here and, and alive. You know, so you need to know who those people are. You need to know who Nancy Hayes is. You need to know who Julie Anthony is. And people from bygone eras like Evie Hayes. You know, she was a huge star in, uh, in musical theatre in Australia. So do you think that's a responsibility of like the educational facilities yes, um, to structure it in? I'm aware that you are sitting on quite a few boards. To listen on those sorts of things and, and what that role is, particularly in times of of COVID. It's obviously really affecting a lot of artists all over the world. COVID is the most challenging uh, situation I think that show business has, has ever had to confront. Mm. I mean if you look at show business and how it um, survived and thrived in situations like World War II, mm. World War I, the theatres were packed yeah. because people could still go and could still escape and the, the cities that they were in were generally safe, except London, of course. They were still in the theatre whilst they were bombing the daylights out of it. Yeah. I'm on the board of the Queensland Theatre Company mm -hmm. and on the board of the Queensland Symphony Orchestra. Both of those organisations are in pretty dire straits because they can't perform. Mm -hmm. you know, there are no stages or theatres for them to perform in at the moment in a safe environment. The first priority is to our performers and, and to our management, but the performers, because they've been cut off at the knees. Um, so the, the symphony orchestra has about 100 orchestral players. So you then have to work out well, what happens. So the first priority is that you have to generate finance so they can continue to be employed. That was the priority that, that we made with the orchestra. The theatre company, because actors are 
contracted on a very uh, much smaller time frame for just doing play and then a different play, blah, blah. That's more difficult. So I've also been uh, involved in raising money for actors with the Actors Benevolent Fund and um, trying to, to find ways of continuing to help put food into those people's mouths. And I'm not convinced that streaming for free is the idea. I mean, I think it's a terrific yes. innovation to be able to do, but I'm not convinced that it should be given away. No. Even if it's for a small amount of money, yeah. you know? It gets, it's like all of the big streaming services now. You don't have to pay very much on a monthly basis to enjoy that, but at least you know you're paying and you're getting value for money. Yeah. But I think once something is given away, its worth is far diminished. You know, the 21st century um, mindset is so, so committed to paying, um, without even thought, paying uh, subscriptions to this and subscriptions to that because they're expecting uh, everything instantaneously. I don't know that that's necessarily a very healthy mindset, but it is what it is. It's very much now. And um, maybe, yeah, that's... The world is moving, so you have to go yeah, with it, but exactly. make sure you get the model right. I do want to touch base quickly on, you mentioned that recently you returned to the stage in um, Harvest Rain's production of Hairspray, oh, yeah. Spam a lot, and then also Spam. starred um, as the wizard yes. in the production Wicked, which mm -hmm. would have been, I mean, it's it's a beautiful story. It's an awesome, yeah, awesome well, part to play, you know. I have to confess that <laughs> I was asked to take over the role that Bert Newton had played and I had never seen the show. Really? So they flew me to Sydney and I, and I watched it for the first time and I was absolutely captivated mm. with the story because I love the, the crossover between the original Wizard of Oz story and they used all of those characters which we all know and love. Mm. And then there was a whole new backstory about that and about those people and characters. So it was fantastic to get your teeth into and particularly working with the original Australian cast that had worked with all of the American people that had come out to, to stage it. So um, it was terrific and the gr good thing for me in my older age is that I didn't have to work too hard. He's not <laughs> on all that often but it's, it's great to be you know, the title role so to speak. So Andy, I was just going to touch on that. Some of your career highlights, you've performed with an 80-piece orchestra. You were you landed a record deal with John Farnham's manager, Glenn Wheatley. You've released original compositions, Good yeah. Friends, which you recorded your own albums, as well as singing and recording with Sony Music Australia. Yeah, well, I sit back and look at it myself now and and as we were chatting earlier, sometimes I'll sit there and think, oh, well, that was another lifetime. Well, that was that chapter of life, and yeah. that was this chapter of life. And I really feel like I, I really feel like I've lived a bit of a book, and uh, I can turn to definitive chapters. Um, and so many of them have been so incredibly interesting, so fun, uh, so hard. But, you know, without them, uh, I would be a very uninteresting book. Yeah. I think the other secret is to be, for every performer, is to be prepared to reinvent yourself. Totally. All of the time. Totally. To come up with the next idea, the next concept, the next character, the next song. You've got to be thinking always ahead of yourself. And then, you know, for, for the four or five things you might be trying to juggle, if you're lucky, one might land in the right spot. Myself, whether it's been on stage or in uh, travelling in uh, the hotel circuit doing piano lounges and mm. internationally, I did that as well. Stage productions, you know, it's been just multifaceted. But at the same time, when I've sort of come back to, to ground and at this stage in my, my life, I decided to reinvent myself and I took myself off to study again and studied audio engineering and I spent a lot of time and a lot of money. I thankfully have always had that drive mm. and that clearly comes from 
you know, driven parents and, uh, and also being surrounded by the arts industry. You know, it's such a driven industry. TV appearances. Good Morning Australia, Good morning. Carols by Candlelight, Bert uh, Newton. Lane. Yes. Um, Bert Newton, Daryl Summers. Uh, but then, of course, I had my own television variety series for two years, oh, that's two right. series on the ABC. So, you know, that was really, really something because the budgets were extraordinary and the production values were huge. Huge production values on the ABC that the commercial channels weren't paying by anyway. That was another whole learning curve to be, you know, thrown in there. I think I was all of 23 and you know, you've, you've got special guests, big stars you've got on the show every week. And people would tune into variety television to see people perform, but it wasn't a talent contest. So Andy, I've been really enjoying the live streaming of your vintage jazz band called Blue Jazz Zoo. That's super fun. Um, that was something that just happened by accident, actually. A very talented young man, uh, Teddy Maxwell. It sort of happened in the way of us just working together and then I was really trying to get him out and, and performing live, which um, he wasn't super keen on doing initially. And so then I said, well, how about we do a gig together? And, and we've been doing gigs together ever since. But now I, he said, loves it. I said, I'm happy to do it. He does. I'm happy to do it as long as we don't do anything similar to what is out there. But I said, we've still got to stay a little bit cutting edge, mm. otherwise, you know, we might get sort Left of lost behind. in the dust. Mm. But everything, we have we put a jazz twist or swing edge to it. And it's just fun to experiment yeah. and step outside of the square and get a song that you would never have imagined to be interesting. Well, we have a little bit of a fun factor here on Arts Talk TV. At the end of our interviews, we do a little shutter speed challenge. Oh here we go. <laughs> Last song you listen to. You are my sunshine. Oh, um, 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 Mamma Mia. Mmm, okay. <laughs> In the car. Yeah, perfect. What does creativity mean to you? Oh, uh, means being absolutely free to come up with something new and original. Adventurous. Love it. Perfect. Person you'd most like to meet? Is it my turn? Mm -hmm. Ooh, I'd have to say uh, possibly Julie Andrews. Mm. I've met her. <laughs> <laughs> wow, what was that like? Oh, fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Really fantastic. Uh, uh, you know, she's exactly as you see her. Mm. Uh, for me, it would be Elton John. I've met, oh. met so many of the others, Peter Allen, um, Barry Manilow, um, but Elton, I've always admired his songwriting. You what know, would you writer. say to him? Oh gosh, what would you say? Except, you know, you, you admire everything he's done, mm. yeah. particularly Yellow Brick Road. That's where yes. I was originally introduced yeah, to Yeah, wow. When they were brand new songs. So, it's great. And what about you? What would you ask? I would have asked her, what did you do as a kid in music? Last piece of art that affected you? It can be anything. One of my father's, actually. And mine too. Wow. My father is actually painting a portrait of me at the moment. Yes. And he's a great painter, great he artist. Yes, he is. And um, he's hoping to enter it into some competitions. If you had to label creativity with a colour, what would it be? What Rando. colour would it be? Mm. Blue. Blue. Okay. What would you miss most about the arts? L live performance. Mm. Yes. Live performance. Yes, there is no, there can't be any life without live entertainment. What's on your bedside table at the moment? A reproduction of a Russian, um, what are they called, those eggs? Um, oh. Oh, the sizing eggs things? No, like... Oh, famous Not Fabergé, Fabergé oh. egg mm. that they, they oh, right, made yes. for the Russian Tsar. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've got a, a replica. I wish it was a real one. Mm -hmm. A replica on the side of my bed, which is lovely. Wow. A, uh, a, a China um, merry-go-round with the little miniature horses. horses. What chore do you most dislike doing? Oh, wow. What chore? 
How much time do we have for this one? <laughs> Just the one that's on your, like the, like mine's emptying the vacuum cleaner. Oh, yeah, that's pretty awful. Yeah, I'm just like, Washing I, I, what, okay. Losing, losing time, you know, uh, losing time where I, I wasting could time be doing maybe something else. where I could be doing yeah. something else. Last but not least, in one word, what does art mean to you? Everything. Life. Perfect. Thank you so, so much for everything that you contribute. I feel like I've just had an educational <laughs> lesson. Your voice, your expertise, how you resonate and um, clearly the importance and that you're making a difference and an effort to the industry is definitely a credit to you guys. Thanks. And thank you so much for contributing That's and lovely. being part of our show. Lovely to be thank part you. of it. Thank you. So glad you could join us today on our arts channel.